Check this stuff out. Thanks, everybody. My name's Craig Cook. Best wave ever written out there. Oh, nice. Look. Give me Mailman on the line. Epics. Last Sunday, 23rd of September, there was a massive avalanche on Manislu that killed between 8 and 11 people. Legendary free skier Glenn Plake survived the avalanche. Unfortunately, his partners, Remy Lecluse and Greg Costa, are missing and presumed dead. Glenn is now back in Kathmandu. We'll be Skyping in with him shortly to hear his version of the events. His wife, Kimberly, will be joining us in the studio. Kimberly, you just stepped off the plane. Thanks so much for coming in to join us. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for asking. It's been a tough few days for you. There's some difficult weeks and months ahead. How are you holding up? I'm holding up great. I just am very thankful and grateful, and I feel very blessed. Tell us about that moment when you first heard the news. Well, it was at 3.57 in the morning, Texas time, and uh, I heard Glenn's voice, and he said, hello, 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 and I said, hello back, and my first thoughts were, we're at the summit, and we're going to be skiing down, because I knew we had that window of opportunity that was coming soon for mm -hmm. a summit and a ski, and he goes, have you heard the news? And I said, what news? No. And he goes, there's been an avalanche, and I'm okay. And I said, okay, how are Remy and Greg? And he says, they are missing, and we are doing our best to rescue and, and try to, to search for them. You've been married to one of the world's most famous free skiers. Right. Uh, you yourself are a very strong skier. Thank you. Obviously a strong woman. How do you, you must worry every time he goes out on something like this. How do you deal with the worry? You know, I get asked this question a whole lot, and for obvious reasons. I mean, Mr. No Fear Man, and, and you know, going out and, and doing all these extreme sports and adventures and expeditions. But honestly, Trey, I have to tell you that I'm at peace with it, and I've surrendered it to the good Lord above, and I really believe that Glenn has the knowledge, the strength, and the wisdom to, to actually participate in this sport, and yet do it in a very intelligent way. Wow, that's such a great way to look at it. Thank Let's you. Let's get Glenn on Skype and uh, have a look at his face. I would be so excited to see him. Hey, Glenn, it's Trey and Kimberly. Hi, Glenn. So good to see you. It's great to see you. It's nice to talk to you instead of someone's some weird sat phone. Tell us where you're at and how you're feeling. I'm at a, a really cool ho hotel in Kathmandu. Uh, other than my body being pretty hammered, uh, I'm feeling really good. I, I walked off the mountain. Glenn, can you tell us what happened last Sunday? Yeah, we had gotten to Camp 3 and uh, didn't. Didn't really like where camp was placed just because it seemed to be prone to anything that did happen. We put our camp where where other people had put camp before, so a little higher to the right. It was about 4.30 in the morning I woke up. We had been getting wind gusts all night long, which was probably what was keeping us up. Greg was kind of rolling around. At this point, I said, Wow, this gust is really strong. Um, and Greg said, uh, I think that's an avalanche. And about a second later, we were hit. Then I felt the actual movement of snow on the me. And quite frankly, I thought that was it at that point. I was kind of pissed at myself that I was going to die in an avalanche um, in a, on an expedition. And then all of a sudden, I came to a stop. So I immediately just you know, went into complete spaz mode trying to make some room. And I realized I was punching the walls of the tent and they were moving. Um, and I couldn't punch room, so I actually kind of like found the door basically and in fact did find the zipper and, and the zipper. And thing I know, I was, I was in the air, free air, but I had no idea where I was or and, uh, but I immediately said, Greg, 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 okay, okay. And, and of course it was dead silence. So I actually had my beacon on me while I was asleep and I turned it on and unfortunately there was no signal anywhere in the area when, wow, okay. So I started just wrapping a tearing and plug anything that I could thinking that it was going to be Greg's sleeping bag. 
and it, it never was. Rami just disappeared. I never even saw one that was even near associated with his tent. So then I kind of regrouped. And I told Henry, I said, I think I'm in a, in a crevasse. Well, I know I'm in a crevasse, and I think I can walk out of this thing. But I was terrified that that thing was going to collapse. When I got up on the Serac, I realized that the entire, the entire oh, no. mountain from 7,500, mm. 6,000 had tip had fall. Mm. And I was looking at 1,500 meter debris field. All of Camp 3 was gone, and it was just nothing but total devastation, including it hit Camp 2. When did you start to lose hope for Greg and Remy? Probably a half hour, 45 minutes worth of looking. I realized that they weren't on the surface and they certainly weren't anywhere near me. Um, I'm sorry to say that later in, in, when, when Doji went back up for his search and I was back at base camp, he ended up bringing down Greg's beacon. It was found on the surface off. Oh. He did not in fact oh. it on. Remy did not have hits on during dinner. He said it was in his tent. Because we were making kind of, not groom jokes, but we were, I checked my batteries because I just put new batteries in. I'm like, man, man I got 100%. Look at that. I kind of closed it and went to bed. Mm -hmm. else? I said, you got yours on? And it's like, yeah, it's in my tent. I said, okay. When, when so, you started to lose hope, that must have been a terrible feeling. How did it make you feel? It upset me because, you know, I, I had that avalanche with, with Nate a few years back, and I was, I was so happy that I was able to make, you know, to in fact make a, a, a rescue. And so the fact that I wasn't able to make a rescue upset me, yeah. I mean, I was pulling everything I could. I, you know, I, I was tearing the tent trying to remove snow. You know, mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't removing any snow because it had gone just absolute. It was like you poured concrete over an old tent and then tried to pull the tent out of it. Mm. Right. You know, when you guys called me from Camp 2, you, you told me there's a lot of snow at Camp 2, that you thought there may be uh, up to two meters at Camp 3. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, you guys are experienced and you, and you evaluated the avalanche risk. And what made you... Uh, Continue up. We were going to just go up there and look around and really, really make an evaluation. And all of us had agreed that as soon as there was any sign whatsoever of unstable snow, we were done. We were going. That was it. There was no pressure to continue. It all agreed on that. Mm -hmm. After 25 years of successful free skiing all over the world, uh, you've, mm. you've been everywhere. What made you want to go to Manislu? You always want to reach farther and go higher. I mean, you've got a car, you want it to go faster. I mean, the Olympics just finished up. I mean, everybody wanted the world record. Everybody wanted the faster time than was done before. I'm not trying to reach out and go bigger and better do things that maybe not have ever been been done. But from a personal standpoint, yet you try to do better for yourself. So the opportunity to ski an 8,000 meter peak came up, of course, I said, absolutely, I'm going to go. Right. Was it a lifelong dream and I couldn't wait for the opportunity? No, that was not the case. But the opportunity did come up. I appreciated what could have taken place. And of course, I said, let's go. Let's go. Let's, it'd be very interesting to, to experience that. Clearly, there are risks involved in expeditions like this. What makes you take those risks? Um, how can you be a police officer and go to work every morning, you know, knowing that someone's going to put a bullet in your head? Or We had a, a, a major, major, major catastrophe, and it's no different than a tsunami or an earthquake or any other natural disaster. It just happened to be one that uh, took place where people were for enjoyment and not for a residence, let's say. Do you think you'll ever try to go back again and ski an 8,000 meter peak or are you done with it now? Uh, I can't really answer it. I think if I don't go back to an 8,000 meter peak, it's not because of the skiing. It's not because of the, that it is simply because of the logistics in and around it. I'm not completely sure I appreciate facing 
commercially climbed mountains. I'd like to find a, a mountain that's seven thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine, and that way the eight thousand meter club doesn't care about it. <laughs> Well, Glenn, that's all I got. Thanks again yeah. so much. And, I love uh, you. I'll see you on Friday. I'll uh, see you guys on Friday. Can't wait. We're going to have a lot of laughs and tears here coming up the next couple of days, I'm sure. There he was. Yeah, so happy for both of you guys that he's safe. Thank you. We are blessed. It's going to be a difficult uh, few weeks and months ahead of you. Best of luck with those. Thank you. Life has changed. That's our show for you this week. We'll see you soon.